Welcome. Thank you for being here for the series, The Mayors of New Orleans. That was entertaining. I think I sensed a little anger on the former mayor's part there. I want to acknowledge some of the uh, former mayor's family members are here. His mother, Sybil, uh, Monique, Sherry, and Jacques uh, Morial are also here. Uh, thank you all for coming here. Several of our panelists have worked with Mayor Morial, and one has reported on the mayor and his administration. Next to me, Sheriff Marlon Gusman served as CAO, Chief Administrative Officer of the City of New Orleans for Mayor Mark Morial uh, from 1994 until 2000. Jed Horn was the city editor of the Times-Picayune during Mark Morial's two terms as mayor. Mr. Horn was part of the uh, Times-Picayune team that won the uh, two Pulitzer Prizes for their coverage of Katrina. Judge Terry Love was appointed by Mayor Mark Morial to the position of Chief Deputy City Attorney for the City of New Orleans in 1994, and she served for the administration for a year and three months. Vincent Sylvain served as the Executive Assistant to Mark Morial for the Mayor's Division of Housing and Neighborhood Development from 1994 until 2002. We want to start now with some introductory remarks from each of the panelists, and since we have a lot of ground to cover in a short period of time, we ask that you keep your comments to about three minutes uh, or less. You've agreed to follow these rules, so please keep your comments to three minutes or less. And we want you to describe the city of New Orleans in 1994 and what the chief challenge was that the city faced and the mayor faced, Mark Morial faced, as he became mayor. Mr. Gusman? Thank you, Dennis. Uh, honored to be a part of this tonight. You know, when I think about 1994 and what we were facing, I remember that there was a real distaste that a lot of people had in their minds about city government, that they really didn't feel that, uh, that involved with it or wanted to be a part of it. And I remember when Mayor Morio got elected and he started this tremendous transition program, tremendous uh, involvement, and really did look for the best people. And when you looked at the result that the transition team did, and as he said, he had KPMG, Pete Marwick do their study and, and their reorganization, there were so many people in the administration with advanced degrees, lawyers, uh, masters, and the good thing about him was that although uh, I say he was a born leader, he would uh, listen to everybody, always make the decision, but would listen. And with the different people that he had around him, uh, there was a lot of discussion, a lot of going back and forth. Uh, ultimately, he would make the decision. And I'll tell you, of course, you, you have to say that in 1994, uh, the city was not safe at all. And we knew that we had to do everything we could to increase public safety. And the mayor set about uh, doing something to make the police department a lot better, uh, getting a new police chief. But more than that, every city department, every city agency supported the police department. We had done a, a budget exercise and came up with the fact that the idea that your top your top department is the one all the others have to support. And we all supported it. And something really interesting that he did, which is really important, and he said it all in there, he really said everything, um, Nord. We took money from the New Orleans Police Department's budget at a time when they were crying for more and more money and put that money into Nord to have those summer camps to have those swimming pools, to have all of those things open. And because you're right, you couldn't, just, you couldn't just have more police out there. You also have to have the community involved. Um, incredible stamina, uh, engaging with everyone. Uh, and I think that's really what made the difference in, in making the city a lot better. And Dennis, I could go on and on. Okay. My three minutes are up. I think your three minutes are up. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Horn? Um, I would just remind people who have been trying to forget and um, try to Im impress on people who weren't here at that time just how extraordinary that crime situation had become, how, how uh, deteriorated the morale of the city was. Um, there was a boldness uh, in, in the mayor's assault on crime that um, <clears throat> I think many of us have missed in a subsequent administration when it comes to tackling a crisis of, of really equal magnitude. Um, 
I remember uh, Chief Pennington talking about how on his, I, th I mean, it's just the most extraordinary story. I think it was his first uh, reception. He was being greeted by the city of New Orleans, and he was pulled aside by the FBI, who had at that point infiltrated the New Orleans Police Department for very good reason, and was told that um, they were going to have to break open uh, an undercover operation that they were conducting because they had just heard over a police radio that they were monitoring that an officer had ordered the execution of a police informant. Uh, Kim Groves, I think, was her name. Um, and uh, Len Davis uh, was taken down in due course and Paul Hardy uh, along with him. Uh, Pennington was just you know, was flabbergasted. He was a man of considerable experience who, who, who had nonetheless never been in anything like this. About two months later, he came up against the, the Antoinette Frank situation where a cop, um, an extraordinary act of theater as well as uh, a criminality, pretended to respond to uh, a, a, a murder, as it happened, um, that she had in fact committed in the course of a detail job on, on a, uh, at a local restaurant. Um, Pennington's improvements were, and reforms were, were numerous and immediate, and um, I think we'll have occasion to talk about them uh, as we go along, but I just wanted to stress that, uh, that uh, point. George Love, the, uh, describe the city in 1994, the chief challenge the mayor faced. Well, first of all, thank you, and I want to tell you a little bit about the capacity I served in, and you'll understand my perspective. As the Chief Deputy City Attorney over Criminal Justice, uh, my responsibilities dealt with uh, some of the civil service cases, and my responsibility also dealt with our cases in federal court. We were facing serious problems as related to judgments against the city. And as some of you might not know, federal judgments can seize assets, whereas city uh, state court judgments should just, as we say, get in line. And that was one of the things that we were really concerned about in the city attorney's office. And one of the things the mayor approached me about which really concerned me was that we were paying judgments for police officers who were still on the force. And if a police officer has been found guilty of misconduct and the city is paying judgments, why is this person still on the force? And that was one of the things we had to go through determine these officers, then we had to deal with the civil service aspect of it. You need good attorneys in civil service, and the other thing you needed, which he had to work strongly with, was Chief Pennington in making sure the process in civil service adhered to the laws in order to make sure that the police officers who were guilty of misconduct were removed. And I think that was one of the greatest challenges we faced from the city attorney's office. The other challenge, which when we talk about crime, and the mayor was so committed to this, was domestic violence. At the time, it was immediately after the O.J. Simpson case, and we determined that in New Orleans, we had no domestic violence laws. Individuals were prosecuted under uh, assault and battery, and we tackled that issue, and we did it with an approach of introducing ordinances, working with the police department. There were so many challenges we faced as it related to the crime that you just didn't understand because those were the aspects of the legal system. And I think the one thing that the mayor clearly understood that he saw as a challenge and something that we always worked on was being effectively represented in court by good lawyers. That was a challenge. Making sure, because at the time, the pay was not that high for your lawyers. So we had to make sure we could secure good attorneys that would go to court and represent the city. So those were the challenges. And on a personal side, this is the story I've always wanted to tell, and I never told the mayor till later. Uh, Chief Pennington is a distant cousin of mine. And when uh, Mayor Moriel began his search, he kept everything so quiet and no one was to know. Well, Chief Pennington called me and he said, is he serious about an outside guy? Because now knowing what had happened in Cleveland, he said, well, Terry, what they'll do is these mayors will say they're doing a national search, whereas the politics has already decided that a local guy would get it. And he said, I don't want to go through that. 
And I said to Richard, I said, oh, he is serious. I said, the problems we have, I know he's serious. And we spoke in confidence. Richard and I met, we had dinner, we talked about a lot of issues. And I never told the mayor <laughs> that, that I played a role in making sure that Chief Pennington <laughs> was willing to accept. And then the chief was really committed to the civil service. And one thing the chief would always do is he would meet with the lawyers so he could understand the civil service rule. That's one thing I think people don't understand. Being a chief of police requires so many aspects. You, you know, you're going in there and making sure that the correct procedure is followed if you have uh, an officer who has not followed the law. Right. So those were the challenges. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Sylvain? I guess one of the disadvantage of going last is sometime your opening statement get taken away from you. And I should have known that's, that you all were going to talk about crime. But Mr. Sylvain, you, you, were, you were in charge of housing, and housing had a lot of trouble with crime. And, and that's what I'm going to say. You know, one of, one of the cries in the city was, uh, in, in 94, was that the last one out uh, cut off the light. But additionally, if, if you recall, our campaign slogan was we're gonna clean up City Hall with the shovel and not a broom. And, and, and that was representative of the, the issues and some of the other challenges the city had. And, and, and while the sign at City Hall read any hall because the, the sea had fallen down, <laughs> it didn't just stop there. The building just was dirty. It was filthy. You didn't get a sense of being in a governmental complex when you went there. Yes, the building was old, but that was not an excuse or a reason for it to be filthy. So we, we thought that we had to start, we had to start there, uh, cleaning up the place that we call home, our work home. The other thing is, uh, as Dennis referred to, we had 37,000 vacant houses in this city. Uh, there was a study that was done prior to or during the transition period and came up with that housing count. And you add to that fact, we also had businesses that had been shut down and they were boarded up. I mean, sometimes that aspect gets lost. But guess what? It wasn't just 37,000 because on the next day, you had more. It kept adding and adding and adding. And it wasn't until we felt that we started to get a grip on the housing issue, the blighted housing problem, that we were going to be able to start to attract other type of industry to the city. So that was one of the other bigger challenges that we faced in 1994. Okay, Mr. Sylvain, with this next round, let's start with you. Uh, what, what changes did uh, Superintendent, Superintendent Pennington implement and what impact did they have on the streets and on the tribe? I think the first thing he did was uh, he brought a level of respect. And, and, and coming from the outside, uh, he didn't have a click that he had to respond to, nor was there anyone within the police department that felt that there was a click that existed that they could go ahead and take advantage of. He came in and implemented a couple of things, uh, community-oriented policing, which seemed to have been forgotten. Uh, and uh, sometimes you hear these discussions right now as if this is just a new invention, but this is something that we did in 1994. Something else he did that was uh, some people call a little bit challenging, a little bit questionable, a little bit maybe even loony. He made a commitment that we were going to go ahead and reduce the murder rate by 50 percent. You know, no one had ever dreamed that that was possible, particularly with under the conditions that we were going on under during that time. So not only did he make that promise, he was able to go ahead and fulfill that promise. And I think that's one of the things that the, the, that the administration hopefully gets remembered for. The crime problem that we had, and yes, we had some rocky roads along the way. The Louisiana piece of uh, a kitchen killing, uh, uh, for instance, was one that, that once again rocked this city. The multiple murders that were taking place during that time frame, but many of the actions and activity that Pennington put forth through the use of Comstead, I think it engaged not just the police department, but it began to engage our citizenry, all congregation together. Uh, act was, was was very involved in our effort. The uh, uh, Business Foundation stepped up and provided some of the necessary financing and resources that were needed to go ahead and implement Com, uh, Comstat. So those were some of the uh, challenges that we face as well as I think some of the accomplishment uh, that we uh, reach in the area of crime. And Sheriff Gusman, he uh, also tried to restore integrity in the police department, right? Among officers. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, I was sitting here thinking about how 
we had the Internal Affairs Division. And the Internal Affairs Division was headed up by a particular guy who uh, really didn't seem like he was with the superintendent's program. And I remember meeting with the mayor and he came up with a real easy one. He said, well, let's just abolish it. He said, we'll create a new program, a new, and that's when we created the Public Integrity Division. And we took it out of uh, the police headquarters and put it in a separate uh, facility over on Broad Street, or right near Broad on Canal. And, and it was, you know, one of the other things I wanted to say about the mayor, meticulous, meticulous with think things out to the, to the very end and make sure everybody had everything lined up. You know, Jed Horn was talking about that when Pennington first got appointed, well, when Pennington first got appointed, you know, we got a uniform for him um, and sized it all up and it was all done without anybody knowing anything about it, who it was for, and in fact there was speculation that the mayor was going to name the first female police chief and, you know, he ended up, um, you know, really just screening on everybody and I remember uh, one of the council members asking me, he says, well, you know, who's the new police chief? And, you know, uh, and, no, she says, who's that? Because he was addressing the council members. We had to give him a raise. I had to make sure that the raise was in place before, um, before we, uh, you know, went out and made it all, went out there and introduced him. And I said, that's him. He starts today, you know, the new chief. Um, <laughs> the curfew center. The curfew center, another example of thinking everything out. The curfew, the curfew law was controversial. We were limiting people's freedoms and their rights. But it was good, it was important, because had we not done that, there would have been more young people killed. But we didn't want them to go to jail, so we had to do it where they weren't in jail. Where, and then he involved the clergy. The clergy had to come and counsel the parents when they came and, and, and picked them up. So it was a, a lot of complex things. You know, and, and this is in all respect to the superintendent of police, Pennington, but many, many nights, it was Mark Morial and the whole group of us coming up with what we would dub Pennington Plan 1 and Pennington Plan 2. And, you know, I remember ABOs. It was commonplace for police officers to work in alcoholic beverage outlets. Work, de work details. Work details. No way. He stopped it. And um, that was big because it was about integrity. It was about, it was about restoring the public trust. But you know, Sheriff Gusman, I've heard now that some of the problems that we've had in bars and restaurants, uh, people have said that if we had police guarding those, working details, that we wouldn't have that kind of crime. Well, I, I disagree with that because, you know, the, the problems that happen in bars now, and this is a practice that's all over the country, Police officers don't work in alcoholic beverage outlets because they have to know that they're working for the people in that community, not for that bar owner, not for that bar owner who's paying them. I think the problems get caused in, in alcoholic beverage outlets because the, the bartenders and the bar managers don't keep a handle on what they're serving their patrons. And that's how it gets out of hand. But, you know, I, I would firmly say you cannot have them. And that's part of that was part of that problem we had. Yes, I'd like to add three points about Chief Pennington that I remember very well. You know, there's an old saying, the clothes don't make the man, but they do set the appearance. He was, he couldn't believe that our police force did not have a professional uniform when he came in. He said they had no dress attire. They only had the carriage. Well, that was one of the things he implemented. The second thing which I think was very important, and Mayor Moriel spoke about this to me recently, Mayor Moriel had a hands-off attitude with the chief of police and his promotion and his firing decisions. I worked prior to my appointment with many faith-based groups, many community organizers, and I can remember many calling me and saying, well, you know, in the past you could call, and the mayor was emphatic that the chief of police runs the police department. I will not get involved in hiring. I will not get involved in promotion. And that gave Chief Pennington the opportunity to make those decisions without any outside political. Mr. Horn, uh, we saw a drop in crime under Pennington, and yet the FBI statistics show that crime went down across the country, that there was sort of a, uh, just a, uh, a dip in, in national figures, that it was uh, maybe a, a time when uh, 
people were getting older, the, the young people who were committing the crimes were getting older and weren't committing them as much. Uh, so was the dip in crime real or just something that was happening, happening across the country? Well, it was both. Um, I think we, we benefited from a national trend. Uh, there was a move away, I mean, at, at the level of pharmacology, we saw a shift away from, from some extremely aggravating drugs like, uh, like crack and a slide back to somewhat more sedate kinds of drug abuse. But uh, more, to the, more to the point, the, uh, the, the, the Pennington administration and, and, and at the police department and, and Mayor Morial, I think, had a way of supercharging that downward drift in crime in, in ways that greatly benefited the city. I'm reminded by Vincent's reference to Comstat, though, of how completely they could at times diverge. Um, Mark was a curious mix, from my perspective, of sort of old school and visionary. And um, one of the old school things about him was that there was a reluctance to, to really modernize the technology at City Hall. We, you know, I think Nagin was perhaps justly critical of the old order when he came in and found that you know, things were still done in shoeboxes rather than on computers. Um, Comstat was a state-of-the-art uh, move towards, uh, for those of you who don't know what it was, um, a very thorough and comprehensive sort of computation of crime trends and then you know, point of point of action kinds of responses to where those crimes were occurring. Um, a, a very powerful tool, I think, uh, in, in, in cutting back on some of this crime. Um, another move in this, I think, was, was very much uh, Mark Morial's move, was a bold and dramatic lawsuit against the gun makers um, of, of the United States. It would have been, it was a, a high profile, high wire act that would, I think, have um, have been a fascinating bit of legislation had it gotten farther along, or litigation, I should say. It was undone, of course, in the court of public opinion by a somewhat clumsy, simultaneous gun buyback that resulted in guns being put back on the street. And I think um, the mayor was sort of duly chastened by some of the negative press and the whole thing went away. The litigation uh, collapsed. But it was that that mix of, of, of kind of visionary and, and then, of course, the, the pragmatics of running the office that could so often uh, catch up uh, on any city administrator and certainly did on occasion uh, Mark Morial. All right, before we lose you, Sheriff Gusman, I, I wanted to ask you about uh, the mayor's strategy for economic development. What, were the, what was the strategy? What were the results? What outside factors affected that strategy? Well, I think his, his primary strategy was that we had to have public safety. Without public safety, we weren't going to be able to attract businesses. He wanted to have clean neighborhoods. He wanted to have safe neighborhoods. Um, he was really uh, the biggest salesman. You know, you talk about a marketer, always you know, going to Washington on the fly-in. Uh, we would go to New York, uh, and he would tout us at New York uh, with the bond people, uh, just really, um, uh, doing everything he could to make sure that the infrastructure was there. But I have to Canal say, Street improvements. people complain that if you were an outsider, it was hard doing business in the city. Uh, I, you know, I didn't see that. You heard that? I don't know if I heard that. I didn't see that. I saw where he was very active in encouraging a lot of people to come here and invest in the city. And there was a lot of investment in the city. You know, the uh, convention center opened. The, the, second phase, third phase of it, the um, uh, arena opened, uh, instrumental in getting the uh, basketball team to come here. More hotel and rooms. More hotel, there were a number of attempts um, not to get, to, to, that other people tried to make them on bringing basketball teams here. Mm -hmm. He stayed dogged at it. I remember going with him and visiting uh, in the commissioner's office. Uh, Trying to, he tried to get an all-star game without a basketball team. But you know, I, I went and checked on the, uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and they show that employment in 1994 in New Orleans was 266,344. In 2002, it was down to 253,859. Look, it, these were tough times. <laughs> they were tough times in the whole community, in the whole nation. And you know, you remember you had, we were coming off of. Uh, uh, the lean trickle-down economic years with uh, Reagan and getting into the, the beginning of Clinton's term. So it was it was tough for us here. This wasn't like we were coming in and we had a whole lot of money. We also, you know, one of the other things here is trying to find a way to finance government. 
we did as much consolidation as we could, as much mission uh, focus as we could, and then ultimately realized that we had to come up with a, a way to get some more money. And uh, the property uh, fee that he tried to do didn't work out, but every mayor before him and every mayor since him is going to have that problem in dealing with getting enough money to properly run uh, the government. You know, I, I wanted to mention on something that Jed said, you know, there's been a lot, all of this hoopla about the technology and all of this. Look, under Mayor Morial, we implemented um, a new system, uh, put a whole backbone for the computer in there. We went from batch driven to online. A lot of training that we had to do for all of the people that instead of putting the uh, payroll system in, in, on cards, they started entering online. Now, you can always improve everything, and, and the way technology goes, it, it's like at light speed. So, yeah, a lot was done, but there was a lot of infrastructure in place to make that happen, to make that possible. I wanted to ask the rest of you about economic development. I mean, what, what did you see in, in, in Mark Morial's strategy and, and uh, impact? Mr. Sillane? We, uh, and as, as Sheriff Gusman alluded to, we focus a lot on the hotel industry, and realizing at the same time we needed to try to diversify our economy but that's what we had going at the time that was the result of the 7,000 plus hotel rooms of uh, the risk calls and hotels you know we started to change the city's landscape the different the different look of what New Orleans looked like you referenced the drop in of employment in 2002 remember tourism was our main industry keep in mind we were, that was on the heels of 911 and when 911 happened, it had an effect on people traveling across the country. So consequently, we started to uh, derive a bigger hit than anticipated. Well, we were during also that, during that time we were also period. still losing population because in '94 our population was 496,092 according to the census estimate. In 2002, 472,500. You're exactly right. White flight continued. The white flight started primarily in the '60s. Uh, then you had the all bus in the 80s, you had more people leaving the cities, and then in, in, by the time 2002 came, it started to continue. Well, what was the, the mayor time. doing to stop that, to keep people here, to bring more people into town? Well, the, one of the main things was providing more housing opportunities. Uh, in 1997, for instance, we, um, uh, I remember reading that what we had accomplished in terms of housing increase was a fluke, and that it would never happen again. 1998 we increased the number from 1997 also during that time period we had the fifth highest increase in residential property value in the nation so we started to put a focus put a shift on creating more home ownership opportunities so that people could begin to own a piece of the well the other part was open access was very important too uh, we wanted to make certain that if we were going to have these development opportunities within the city infrastructure projects some of the other things that relied on, 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 on assistance from government that everyone was going to be able to participate in, in, in this new economy and that was a big emphasis that we placed throughout the tenure of the administration all right sheriff gusman is left and michelle moore who was communications director under mayor morial has joined us now and, and what would you like to say about economic development i mean that was a big issue uh, as he ran for office the first time and the second time and i mean there's uh, i think people would dispute the results i mean there's some disagreement over how successful he was mm -hmm. i i think that People have to look back in 1994 and see that the city was very tourism driven. And part of the mayor's strategy was to ensure that we had a diversified economy. And that meant a combination of reducing crime so that tourism could stay and continue to evolve. Uh, it was also reinvesting in infrastructure so that uh, businesses felt that this was a place where they could do business. Um, we had crumbling streets. Uh, we had a, a, not, a, not the greatest transportation system. Uh, we had a port that was not a, a first class port. We had an airport that was not a first class airport. So in combination, the idea was how do you not only create jobs through an, uh, an increase in infrastructure spending mm -hmm. uh, in the passage of the bond issue, $300 million bond issue in 1995, plus reducing crime, plus creating opportunities both on the international front to invest in the port. Now New Orleans has one of the, the, the fourth largest port in the United States and kept that going. 
And then you have all this great hotel development that happened since that time, the Lowe's Hotel, the Ritz-Carlton Hotel, the Marriott Courtyard. Those things were not there in 1994. So you had to create a climate for investment and a climate for private investment and, and public funding. And the bond issue for infrastructure, one of those was bankroll. I mean, it wasn't spent on the streets as it was supposed to be. Well, a, a good portion of those monies were spent on the street, and a good portion of those monies were also spent in, in improving the airport. And the airport now, if you, if you come into Terminal C and D, you have an airport that is a first-class airport. When I was here in 1994, and having been away from the city now for 10 years, I see the difference. Mr. Horn, uh, how would you rate the airport's uh, change in appearance and uh, uh, ability to attract business? Um, I think the airport was was legitimately um, targeted for being a real dog um, <laughs> when when Moriah came in into power, um, and there had been a great hue and cry during the the campaign, um, a lot of criticism of Bartholomew for having turned it into a patronage, um, you know, sort of uh, wallow out there. <clears throat> um, that unfortunately didn't change all that much, um, and this was one of the one of the ways when we sort of harped on, on Mark and maintained the adversarial relationship that uh, he came to love with his hometown newspaper. <laughs> um, you know, I think, I think at the end of the day, patronage, you know, was a problem in, during the Morial administration, and, and we were often seen as overzealous in trying to smoke it out. Um, at the end of the day, there's some prosecutions that kind of support our view of some of what went wrong. Whether that really means there was more uh, corruption or cronyism, patronage, or simply a more efficient U.S. attorney functioning at that time, I'll leave to historians to um, to debate. Michelle would regularly remind us when we talked about um, you know some of these problems of patronage that this was kind of I mean the sort of subtext was well this is how it's always been done here and frankly I think she was absolutely right. Um, for generations uh, during the period of white hegemony in New Orleans. But should we seek something better? Um, I think we should. I think, I think Mark did and failed uh, in that respect. I do not see, and I'll conclude with this observation um, from as broad a perspective as I'm capable of, I don't see the Morial administration or its, even its you know, worst uh, offenders. I'm reminded, uh, Jacques reminded me of, of Dutch Morial's old rule, no turkeys but also no hogs. I don't think there were turkeys in the group that uh, ultimately was found to be at fault in some of these practices. There were some hogs, and, um, and I think that's a real problem. Like his father, I think Mark Morial saw that the critically important thing for New Orleans was to rebuild a middle class. And if that was going to be a black middle class, well, so be it. You know, and if the patronage was going to help uh, to uh, redistribute some of the wealth traditionally gathered up by the big old white law firms and redistributed amongst uh, new black professionals, so be it. I think, I think Mark saw himself as part of the third wave, if you will, of the civil rights movement. There had been the legal, great legal triumphs of the, of the 50s and 60s, um, some of them handed down by our own judge wisdom, the implementation of DSEG and that kind of thing. There had been the great political victories embodied in no one more exactly than Dutch Morial himself. And now came time, I think Mark saw, for the economic phase of the civil rights movement to become triumphant. And I think some corners were cut there, some concessions were made to, um, you know, to, to uh, slovenly, slovenliness in city contracting. That ultimately proved to be an embarrassment. The city's economy, if I may dispute my colleague Michelle here, really didn't diversify. For all that Mark tried to make it a more diverse economy, it really remained trapped in tourism. Mm -hmm. And um, that's where we, we were and are. Uh, you know, as, as Katrina kind of puts a book into that chapter in our history. Okay. Uh, Judge Love, what would you say about economic development and the airport in particular? I, I'm, I'm curious what you, do you feel the airport has changed dramatically, that it changed dramatically under Mark Morial? Because you know when Nagan ran for office, that was still an issue. It was a bottle when Nagan ran for office. I think it did change under the mayor and, and one of the things I will say 
as, I, as you started off in the introduction, having left uh, the administration within a year, there were quite a few uh, matters that came before me as a judge as it relates to litigation. So I would prefer to remain uh, under the canons not to discuss in it. I would just say there were improvements. <laughs> but at the time, I was a judge on some of those cases. Uh, Michelle, what was the relationship, the mayor's administration, the administration's relationship with the media, and how did that affect uh, his success or difficulty? Well, uh, I have the enviable position now, bet sitting between the WWL and the TV. <laughs> it feels like old times again. Um, uh, you know, part of the agenda uh, internally in City Hall was that, one, we had to really revitalize not only what government did on a day-to-day -day basis and uh, the energy and enthusiasm, and, but we also had to engage people, and we had to really change the hearts and minds of citizens. At the end of the day, if people didn't understand that we were engaged and involved in making change, and we had to report that on a daily basis, I, I am uh, thrilled to have uh, one of my deputy directors, former deputy directors, Denise Stopano, and she was uh, one of the mayor's chief speech writers. And uh, we, I think, uh, I had been with the administration in about three and a half years, almost into the fourth year, and I, when I left, we had written 1,093 press releases, uh, which mean on average we were doing a press conference every day. Uh, but part of the challenge was to be able to communicate what was going on. And when we made a mistake, admit the mistake and move on and say what were we doing to fix it. Um, our relationship with the press was a seven day event. Uh, sometimes I remember getting calls on Sundays, well, what are we doing today? I, was, I think we're resting, God's resting, we're resting. <laughs> so um, it was, a, it was a, a challenging relationship, but I think a good relationship. We tried to be responsive, we tried to set the tone in the agenda in City Hall, and uh, I think that we created not only enough press, but um, had substantive information to both report and to uh, work through. I have to say that on the TV side, it was difficult to keep the mayor off of television because there was always some event that plan. he was taking part in. Uh, I have to ask you about the, the officials in the administration who've been the focus of federal investigations. Gone to prison since leaving office. The huge $81 million contract with Johnson Controls. Political insider and airport concessionaire Stan Barry got five years for that. Former property manager Kerry Decay, nine years. Contractor Reggie Walker, 30 months. Morial's uncle, uncle Len Heidel, uh, had a lucrative consulting contract with the Regional Transit Authority during Morial's eight years at City Hall, pleaded guilty to bilking the RTA out of more than, more than half a million dollars. How does that, uh, how does that, what impact does that leave on his legacy? It's unfortunate that, you know, if we could kind of look holistically at the process, there were 3,000 people that worked for City Hall. Mm -hmm. Um, 225 uh, minority and small business contractors. Uh, but the focus in the last two or three years has been on fewer than seven people. Uh, we were embarrassed by the wrongdoing, and those individuals are now paying for um, their, uh, their, their wrongdoing. Uh, at the end of the day, we are so proud, very proud of all the things that we accomplished in that eight years. And obviously, the mayor, after millions of dollars of investigation and what have you, has still found to be, have his name both clear and never formally charged with anything. And I think it's an important context to take. Um, uh, it was unfortunate, and we're all very disappointed with uh, those individuals, but over time you hope that your record will show, and the facts will show, that uh, this administration did more to progress this city in eight years than clearly the administration now has done. Judge Love, what, what's your... Uh, I would concur wholeheartedly with my colleague's uh, assessment of uh, the mayor. Does it tarnish the mayor's legacy? Well, I think it depends on who's looking at it. I think it always depends on the glass and from which you view it. Because as we've sat here tonight, we've talked about his legacy of improving crime. We've talked about his legacy of working with the community. I can think about his legacy and working with the faith-based community. I can think of his legacy and how the people were excited when Mayor Moriel was mayor. There was just yeah. such an excitement in this town. So I think that as far as his legacy, I think as with anything, there are things that are out there, but as Michelle has so aptly explained, it, there has been nothing found against Mayor Moriel. And I think that we should focus always on those aspects that we can see that were positive with this administration. And those who wish to make other judgments, that would be their judgment call. Mr. Sylvain? And, 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 and as I ask you this, Mr. Sylvain, I, I mean, Mayor Morial signed that contract. 
He signed that Johnson Controls contract. Let, let me address, it, it, it's, it was unfortunate, very unfortunate. And he was a hands-on mayor. And, and we, for seven and a half years, we took, and maybe even a little bit longer than that, we took pride in saying that we ran a scandal-free administration. A scandal-free administration. And it hurt uh, when, 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 when those who we trusted, you know, we knew we had to look out for the unknown. We didn't think we had to be as careful as we perhaps should have been uh, with those who are on the inner side. My lesson came early. Uh, I think even prior to to uh, our inauguration, I can recall going to Baton Rouge and, and having a conversation with someone who walked up to me and he called me Glennis. <laughs> and he proceeded to talk about how close he and Vincent were. <laughs> and how he and Vincent had played ball in Pontchartrain Park. And I grew up in St. John Parish. <laughs> and Vincent wanted him to have such and such. And I remember telling him that I said, if you and Vincent that close, who am I to come in between y'all? <laughs> <laughs> you got it. And I remember someone asking me, they said, oh, why didn't you tell this guy who, he, who you were? I said, eventually he'll figure it out. <laughs> he'll figure it out. You know, so, so we, we knew we had to be careful of, 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 of those who approached us. Uh, those who, who, who we were closer to, unfortunately, uh, we perhaps didn't put a, as much of a watchful eye on, on those as we should have. You know, it's interesting, the mayor's uh, re-election, he had 79% of the vote. Um, how, do, how would you describe the changes in racial attitudes and demographics during this trip? Um, I think that was, was interesting in 94 in his campaign was the Gumbo Coalition, and it really talked about two or three things. One, it talked about how a gumbo in its flavorfulness has distinctive characteristics that work together. And part of the coalition building process in 94 and subsequent to that was putting together the idea that people of different stripes, different concerns, and different issues could have a shared vision. And he was extraordinary at doing that. Uh, it, it, you know, in 1994, we come with a murder capital of the nation. In 1996, we're, we win the All-America City Award. So it talks about the coalition building that was happening both in the city and in, around the region. Um, the other thing that was important, and I think that the city has lost that, that ability to understand a shared vision, to understand everyone's role, and to play a part in solving common problems. Uh, so it's, it's unfortunate that uh, we've, we've lost many years of progress around uh, a lot of uh, division and uh, inclusive. Do you think we're more, we're more divided now than we were? Yes. Then? Yes. Unfortunately so. I'm afraid so. Judge Love? I do agree with Michelle that we are more divided now, but I think one of the points that you raised earlier that I think plays a factor is that the national scene. There are other things that have an impact on the local politics and the division. As far as when the mayor was reelected the second time, at that point I moved on to the judiciary, but the thing that I'd like to highlight is what Michelle just covered was that original campaign and how inclusive and how it was just such a focus on one New Orleans coming together to address issues. There was not a strong of a racial divide at that point. I do not think. Uh, Mr. Horn? Actually, I wanted to ask you, uh, when, I, when we were talking about the uh, corruption, I didn't get to you. Uh, do you think that affected the mayor's legacy? Well, I don't think there's any doubt that it will go down as part of his record, and I'm sure that nobody regrets it more um, than Mark Morial. I don't believe uh, and never did believe that Mark was on the take or anything like that and I'm prepared to look at the numbers as, as Michelle has set them out and see that seven folk out of 3,000 and so on and so forth. But the, the mystery to me, and I'd, and I'd love to talk this over with, with Mark and I've never had the opportunity, he was, as you've suggested, Dennis, one of the most micromanager style, hands-on guys. I think Stephanie Grace, my colleague at the Times-Picayune, um, 
got Marlon Guzman at one point to describe uh, his employer as a mayor who wanted to know everything about everything. And I, from my experience with him, he generally did. And so the mystery to me is how he dropped the ball, how he let, you know, looked away, and this kind of stuff flourished um, to the to the extent that it did. I'm sure he re he regrets it. I'm sure he feels let down. Um, there's always disappointment in anything as complex as a political administration, particularly one that lasts for, for eight years. Uh, but I think he's, you know, certainly sorry about that. How would you describe his success in bringing people together? Well, I think, you know, the. I think all the right things were said, and he stood on the right, certainly on the right side of, of that issue, that effort to, to build a collaboration. Um, and I think he did within a certain sector of the society. Um, I think young professionals got over some of the racial uh, divisiveness and, and the barriers that had kept them apart. Then I look at the numbers, and I see, okay, nine, I think he got 9% of the white vote in, 94, all right, Donnie Mintz was white, Donnie Mintz was a businessman, well regarded, um, and better known actually at that point, I think, than, than Mark, who was seen as still somewhat, even, even within the black community, as perhaps not, you know, kind of a wannabe, not yet his father's heir, um, you know, not, not, not as big a boy as, as Dutch had been. He quickly proved, proved them wrong. Um, 90, uh, 98 comes re-election, and okay, he got 42% of the black vote, and so you say, well, that's almost five times, uh, you know, an improvement over, the, over that earlier performance, but that still means that 60% of the white vote opposed him at a time when there was virtually no other candidates running. So you have to look and say, there's something entrenched about the racism here, and then clearly the fact that, that Mark Morial winds up having to move to New York, as so many other professionals have, in order to further his career in a state like Louisiana, I mean, were he to aspire to statewide office, is basically the chances were zip in at that point, and he realized it and left. And so you have to you have to remember that this is, after all, um, a, a city still divided racially. Okay, uh, Mr. Sylvain, what accomplishments uh, did Mark Moriel make that are still with us today? Uh, I think we kind of I, I alluded to it a little bit earlier. We change the physical landscape of, of the city, the, the, uh, the skyline of New Orleans is, is forever changed. Uh, but equally as important, the mindset of, of, of this was a city of renters, 40% uh, renters. And in a healthy city, you generally have uh, the opposite, 60% homeowners. And at the end of our term, we were approaching that 50% mark. I think that is something that 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 that, that change the the neighborhoods. Uh, when you when you talk about the uh, uh, physical structures, the Harris Casino, for instance, uh, that that project uh, ha has gone through bankruptcy. I think twice now. Uh, it was on the brink of uh, of collapse, and I think he 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 helped to pull that together. And I can recall very vividly uh, not only helping to to make certain that. The necessary financing and that project remain alive, uh, but getting city support services, uh, that initial agreement uh, that we were able to get with Harris after Burgess being put out of the governor's office. I remember going up to to uh, uh, the mansion in Baton Rouge, and that was, and that was who was governor at the time. Uh, basically, said, um, well, "Fellow, this meeting is over. You know, you're going to get." I think it was three million dollars, four million dollars, something to that effect, and not a penny more. And and uh, we left kind of dejected, but we left determined that that was not the final word. And Mark, you know, he, he, that, that the drive, I think that helps drive him, and and and, and it improved what was not a great deal for the city of New Orleans into a better deal for the city of New Orleans. Uh, the uh, sports arena, you know, we're talking about changing the landscape. You know, oftentimes, and I, I can recall having a discussion with someone who was trying to convince me that it was uh, Mayor Nagan who had done the sports arena, and Mayor Nagan who had brought the harness down here. And then I, uh, I brought up the fact, I said, you remember that shot Mark took from the sideline at this press conference? <laughs> and he said, that sure is the truth. You know, so <laughs> oftentimes, you know, when, when, when time passes, 
You know, we, we, we have either selective amnesia, we have revisionist history that starts to take place, and then sometimes you have people who just don't know. Uh, uh, you know, so, so many of the accomplishments, the Soleil Apartments, uh, the American Can Company, uh, we mentioned earlier the, the old DH Home Project, um, the red streetcars. And the reason why that one is so easy to remember along Canal Street line, Mark was determined that it would be red. Mm -hmm. That's why they're red. You know, when you go out to the old St. Thomas site, that's a development that was conceived in our administration. When you took a, take a look at the changes at the old desire, that was done through our administration. When you take a look at the Algiers complex, that was done in our administration. You know, and I don't think oftentimes people can remember or reflect that yes, the ribbon may have gotten cut at a different time, but the plans were done under Mark Morio. Judge Love? Well, the first thing, as I said earlier, would be the domestic violence ordinance. I think that the opportunity that we were finally able to get a law in place to address that issue, and also during that time we worked with faith-based groups. That's another thing I see as one of Mayor Morio's accomplishments, was his ability to bring faith-based groups and community groups into government to assist, because you need those people who are committed to the community there. And Mayor Morio had that ability, and I've not seen that used in other administrations the way I saw Mayor Morio use that. And also during that time, we were able to uh, remove the backlog of city judgments, as I mentioned earlier because those were factors that were affecting the city's bonds rating. And I think the other thing that I would say that it was Mayor Moriel's management style and his professionalism that I think uh, took him to New York to head up such a great organization as the National Urban League. Mr. Gordon? I just, in the spirit of, of avoiding revisionist history, I gotta, I gotta tweak one thing that, that Vincent said, which was that actually the arena credit where credit is due was initiated by Bartholomew. The Hornets belong certainly to, to Mark Morial and that was a, a considerable accomplishment. Um, I think, you know, after all is said and done and, and, and uh, the dust settles, um, context is revealing here. Um, context of what followed Mark Morial's administration makes us, I think, in many cases yearn for the leadership, um, the, the sense of spirit and energy that, uh, that he had, still has, for that matter, a um, young man um, still functioning at high power. Um, beyond that, I think one of the messages that still resonates from the Morial years is that there is a role for government, that this genuflection at the altar of, of sort of the business class without any real um, uh, collaborative role or initiating role from, from government is, um, is disproven by, by his example. Um, he was not a neocon, he was a pre-neocon, if you will, and um, even though his final years were spent under, the, under you know, George Bush's administration. And that's, uh, that's something for the city to, to bear in mind. We have a very strong uh, mayoral role as, as devised and defined in the, in the city charter. And uh, Mark Morial, uh, <clears throat> like his father, who was one of those folks who was big enough to kind of fill the room and perhaps take a lot of the oxygen out of it at the same time, but um, you know, it was somebody, uh, sort of, uh, somebody with the ambitions to match the office, I guess would be a way to put it. Not all of them realize. This war? I think it's a combination of what everyone has said. One, it's the impact on the infrastructure and the differences that you can see in the city on uh, now uh, that they were not apparent in 94. Also, it was really bringing vitality and leadership and coalition building. People forget the relationships that were forged in, forged in Washington uh, under the Clinton administration and some that continued through the Bush administration that got us federal funding uh, state-supported funding that had not happened in the past and he just had an incredible ability to get people on the same page and to bring city, the city resources that had never been brought before and so uh, that's part of his legacy. Toward the end he devoted uh, quite a bit of attention to a third term effort to try to get, in, trying to get the legislation passed so he could uh, run for a third term. Did he squander his political uh, capital? I, 
and defer to my colleagues. Judge Love? Well, I, th I think that would be a decision that he would have to make. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think that I could address that. I think that would be a question that Mr. Mayor would have to address. Yeah. Um, and I just want to add, I guess to tag on to what Michelle was talking about, but some of the other support, some of the other accomplishments were in the federal agenda that we did on an annual basis. And, and oftentimes, the project may not necessarily have been under uh, the name of the administration, but the Naval Support System, the Technology Center, the D-Day Museum, you know, all of those we played a role in, 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 in working with federal leaders to try to help secure some of the necessary funds and the necessary dollars that we need in order to bring those, those projects into the reality. Uh, in reference to the third term, um, once again, we were disappointed with the outcome. Mm -hmm. But in essence, I think what the third term may have done was it extended Mark's term in office. It prevented him from becoming a lame duck mayor year four. And that extended his influence, his ability, and his political stroke all the way to the very end. Also keep in mind that in spite of the fact that he was not successful with third term, and I don't think it was a rejection of Mark Morial rather than a rejection of the concept because his approval rating uh, hovered around the 60% range in spite of the fact that he was not able to get the electric votes to go, the electoral votes rather, to go that way. I'd like to add one mm -hmm. point, something I made a note on earlier, and something that's very important now, is Memorial was ahead of the time on recycling issues. If you remember during the time of his administration, we were going green before green became uh, a slogan. There was recycling, and I was speaking with him earlier, and that recycling has stopped. There was a time when we were recycling here in mm -hmm. the city. When did that stop, though? Did it stop during his administration? No. 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 It did not stop during his administration. And that's one of the legacies that I think we need to try to bring back. And, and that is the future. The green. Green is the future. Let me ask you about his qualities of leadership. And, and, and I don't want to hear just about the good. I mean, what, everyone has faults. And, you know, things we do well and things we don't do so well. What were the good points and the bad points of Mark Morial's leadership? I'll start with you. Oh, he's serving me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, the great things about his leadership is he can make a decision. Uh, and sometimes, uh, despite uh, our, our disagreements, he would make a decision. Um, and that was, and he always had a vision, he always had a, a strategy, and he was very thoughtful in his decision making. Um, the challenges of his leadership sometimes is, you know, I would be known for the what I call the elbow grab. And this, I can't get him out of a room. It takes me 30 minutes to leave a room with a guy. He loved people. And uh, sometimes uh, that gave us a tendency to be behind schedule a lot. Uh, and, you know, you got you fellows in the press, you guys in the press would look at me like it's my fault. Um, and so there was uh, the balance between uh, Mark, the engager of people, uh, and the, uh, the thoughtful statistician as well as the, uh, the public personality and the, the director. But you, one thing that you did know that you were in the room of a leader who was thoughtful, who wanted your input, uh, that would make a decision, and that you were going to move or be left behind. Mr. Sylvain, good points, bad points about his leadership? Uh, going good points. I don't know if I'm trying to find some bad oh, points. On. You know, he had, he had an uncanny knack of, of making everyone feel that they were important. Mm -hmm. Mark would go to a staff person, an individual a citizen, and he would call them in, and I've got this assignment for you. <laughs> <laughs> and I know you can handle it, and I really want to trust you to do it. Right, Jane? <laughs> and Jane would leave the room <laughs> knowing that she's got this charge to follow, and she's the only person that Mark trusted to do it. And then you'll go to Alan. Alan, I got this assignment for you. And you're the only person who I really trust. The guy, Jan is trying to put it together, but I'm not sure she can handle it. But I know you can get it done. So now Alan leaves the room thinking that she is the one that, 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 that has to go ahead and carry out this task. But he had everyone doing the same thing. 
everyone pushing toward whatever that goal happened to have been. And I think that was one of uh, 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 his, his, his greatest attributes. You talk about a weakness, um, Mark didn't like getting rid of people. Uh, and he had a strange way of doing it. He would find someone to recruit the person he no longer wanted on his staff. And I, I can recall one person coming to me and said, Vincent, I've got this wonderful opportunity, man. I don't know how to present this to the mayor. Uh, I don't want to leave, but uh, this is something I just can't pass up. You know, and I said, look, man, uh, he's going to be highly upset. I said, well, so what you ought to, just let me tell him. And I'll be the one to go ahead and let him know that you've got this opportunity that you just can't pass up. But he was the one who actually had set it up. And that was his way of trying to make certain that everyone was pleased, everyone felt important, even on the way out of the door. Uh, so if you, if you look for a weakness, uh, that may have been, some may uh, attribute that as, as part of a weak character. Mr. Horn, you want to, on the year on the outside, what, what good points and weak points did you see in the record players? Well, there was only one time I was on the inside, and that's when, the one time I had to step between the mayor and a reporter whom he had come to despise. and. Um, this was an ill-fated attempt on my part to sort of play Henry Kissinger at Camp David here, and I won't say who was Anwar Sadat and who was Menachem Begin, but all of a sudden this civilized conversation, or what I had proposed should be a civilized conversation, had ended, and they both had stood up and were in each other's faces, and the reporter had his fist out, cocked, and um, there was only one level of of escalation beyond that in my dealings with the Morial family and that would be when Mrs. Morial, Sybil, would show up at the newspaper and then, then you knew that you were in deep, deep trouble. So was this um, a good point or a bad point? <laughs> <laughs> um, impressive women in the Morial family, I'll leave it at that. I will, I will raise, I will see Michelle uh, and raise her one as regards the mayor's tardiness for visits. He was always late. He was invariably late no matter what the occasion. He even stood up Ashton Phelps uh, on the occasion of the ritual <laughs> burying of the hatchet after, after the paper had, uh, had endorsed Donald Mintz, proving once again that an endorsement from the Times-Picune was the kiss of death. <laughs> quite, <clears throat> quite literally, in the case of oh. poor old Donald Mintz. <clears throat> Couldn't, couldn't resist that, but that was that. That brings the conversation full circle back to that memorable evening, because right there on the TV screens, as we uh, waited for Mark to show up at the some grand hotel along Canal Street for this this ceremonious dinner, was the footage of the O.J. Simpson. Bronco going down the, the LA freeways, and we didn't care whether Mark Morial showed up or not. We were just gonna, and I'm sure he was back in his office watching the same thing. But once again, we were late for dinner. Finally, Joe Club. I, I think first of all, the good was his love of people, and that that's the thing that I remember the most during any of my interactions with Matt Morial was that he had a real compassion for people. Now, on the fault side, it pretty much piggybacks on what everyone else has said is the time management issue. Uh, I can remember sitting outside of his office long hours waiting for the next meeting. And I can remember early on, and I think the thing that made us all happy was when he started dating Michelle. <laughs> I remember that because at a point, because Memorial was not married, he didn't, he didn't have the same issues that some of us had. I had a young child and a husband, and there's so many other people here who can attest to that. His, his conception of time was somewhat different than ours. <laughs> we now have, uh, thank you all very much, we now have time for questions from the audience. Uh, if you'll raise your hands. Uh, okay, uh, I've got my spiel down now. Um, the question should be a question, and remember that we have a limited of time this evening. First question. I'd like to ask a question about the Abraham Hunt gorilla in the room, and that's the relation to the city council. And I say that because in the film, uh, Mark Morial makes the point that he was directly out of the legislature and that had some uh, factor in his, in his ability 
to uh, act as a, to act effectively as an executive. And yet, my recollection, and Mr. Sylvain made a point that we had to, we have to forget how history has unfolded. My, my recollection is that his relations with the city council were often very fractious and, and divided. In fact, they talked about talked about various types of, of factions of you know paralyzing city government. So I'd like to hear your comments about how Mark Morial's relationship with the council were, especially whether you thought that he made mistakes in trying to maintain or cultivate effective relations with the legislative branch. I, uh, I love the council, all of them. <laughs> I think some of what you all may have seen from the outside wasn't always uh, reality. Uh, Mark maintained his, his, his luncheon with every council meeting when he had the lunch, during council meeting days. Uh, some of what you saw was uh, political engagement on both parties, on, on our part as well as uh, part of the council that was, uh, we knew if we needed to get an issue passed. For instance, there was one member of the council we could engage into a battle and that person would step up, take the bait, and then we can go to our people and get our, our method, our measure passed. Uh, so some of what you saw was uh, what may have been controversy were actually orchestrated and planned. It happened, it happened on both ends. I can recall getting called be, uh, before, I'll call, getting called by one council member to tell me about uh, a relative of theirs who was coming up with some blighted property hearing and they had owned all these properties in uptown New Orleans. And, and Vincent, I've got to go to this family reunion uh, this weekend. So, and he's going to come up to you and with some relief. And I'm ready to fight because I'm not going to back away from my stand at all. And the council person then said, whatever you do, don't give it to him because the B doesn't deserve any help. You know, but when we went down before the council, the TV cameras there, she played it out as if she really wanted relief granted. So, so lots of time what you saw as battles were part theatrical. Uh, I, I also think that to some extent, um, there were certain council members, obviously, who had a very different pro point of view around the administration and the, what we believed was the, pro the progress the city needed. Uh, but Mark was always, the mayor was always able to build that coalition of four to five votes. And that coalition stuck together pretty strongly. And I think uh, those council members who were cons in consistent opposition made us better. Um, you know, when we were going through the police residency law, when we were going through pay increases for police officers, bond, um, bond issues, um, there was a lot of opposition to those things. And um, uh, some of that opposition came from um, influence from other parts of the region, uh, a suburban point of view. I remember uh, really having a tough time with um, uh, the uh, police union at the time, PANO was very strong and we had a lot of opposition to a lot of change that Chief Pennington and the mayor were trying to do in the police department. Uh, and there were some council members who wanted to the status quo to, to stay the same. And, and we um, really had to work hard around that. But uh, there was always a continual uh, uh, push and, 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 and shove between the council and the mayor. But the mayor was able to build a, a core coalition of council members and for the most part would carry the majority in, in, in crucial times and crucial, crucial legislation. And, and Dennis, I have to add this, and, and in spite of what we may have felt about individual council members, Mark made it certain that you better respect them. You have to respect the office that they held. So you didn't see us going down there and engaging in battles before that council, in that council chamber with those council members, and that was out of respect for that office. And, I, and somehow, some of that has gotten lost, because they are the ones who were actually elected by the people. The appointed officials, we were selected, not elected. Next question. 
uh, in light of the 7,000 hotel rooms, didn't that put a lot of work of uh, women had to be kicked off the of welfare? Like in Michigan, they had nowhere to go. But when y'all built those 7,000 hotel rooms, they had somewhere to go to work, even though it was a small paying job. Also, uh, along that same line, he put a lot of work on kids in the summertime. He gave jobs to kids in the summertime. So a lot of poor people had bread on their table because of Mark H. Wood, like my grandson would say. <laughs> okay, I guess, yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree. I, I couldn't agree more. You, you talk about youth, and I think we have not properly discussed uh, what we did uh, uh, in the area of youth, not just. When people think of youth, they think of NARD and recreation. But our uh, youth team, uh, youth bill, uh, Ellen Lee, who was here, who, who played a leadership role uh, in that aspect, providing training, providing job experience, lifelike experience for the youth were very important. And our program actually became part of national models that other cities started to emulate, particularly once Mark became president of the uh, U.S. Conference of Mayors. Um, when we had a chance to try to spread the message of what we had done in the area of youth development uh, over the years. The next question. I have a question for the media uh, concerning the Johnson Controls contract. I know the mayor always lamented that we didn't get more coverage on that contract, so that's why, you know, after the fact, sure he did not have any idea of what was going down with this but the only coverage we did have on the Johnson control contract and this was at the time that Frank Donzia had his heart attack and I believe Frank did a piece on the uh, traffic lights and one of the stations did come out and do a piece with Carrie Dutay but why did the media not at that point cover the Johnson control contract which the mayor used to suggest that would save the city millions and millions of dollars? Well, I, I would answer that question if I could agree with the premise. I think the media did cover that, certainly not as intensely as, you know, when it got all juicy and, and scandalous, but um, that, that contract was covered, and Frank Donzi wasn't the only one who wrote about it. I can't speak for the television channels, but um, that was, you know, an $81 million contract. We, we, we did pay attention. But I, I do know that the mayor lamented that we did not get as much coverage as he thought we should have. Well, I'm sure there were any number of occasions when he would have liked more or less, but <laughs> what can I say? We, we we tried to do what we could. Dennis, you might. I, I, I think we, I don't think we covered it as much as we should have until we realized that there was a problem with it. Um, but we didn't know before, uh, before the authorities started investigating it that there was a problem with it. Yeah, next question. I believe in the 4E system, and that is equity within the economy and the environment is only reached through education. Haven't heard many of you speak about education. What did Mayor Morial do with an educational system for the city? Well, part of, um, uh, this, I still believe I know at one time, uh, part of the third term effort was, was to key component. try to get the mayor's control of, uh, of education. And now that I live in the city of New York and Mayor Bloomberg has done an incredible job uh, with uh, the, the public school uh, system there. Um, but part of the commitment to what he could do with education was he uh, put a lot of money into uh, the infrastructure uh, of supporting and rebuilding schools. Uh, many schools were decrepitated. Uh, there had not been uh, any infrastructure improvement in schools for a very, very long time. So part of it was what he could do in, in, in his role as mayor, and that was to uh, see some capital improvements in, in the conditions of schools. The mayor was also very instrumental in the formulation of the uh, New Orleans Education Foundation. I think that's another fact that oftentimes gets overlooked the role that he played but trying to develop that. And, 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 and at most, he, he, he played a role in terms of the bullet pulpit. Uh, he played the role of an advocacy, uh, not just with, uh, uh, with the bond issues that were passed, but when there were legislation that affected the school system and our, the education of our children, he was in Baton Rouge, he was at the federal level uh, pushing them. When I talked about the federal agenda a little bit earlier, the federal agenda didn't just stop 
with the halls of City Hall. I mentioned the DD, I mentioned the, the, the uh, UNO Technology Center, but it also included members of the Orleans Parish School Board and members of the New Orleans Education Foundation advocating for changes and stuff that we felt as a community would be better for this city. You've all spoken about, um, about Moriel's desire to, to know what was going on in his administration and to, and to be in charge of what was happening. And I was wondering if during his administration questions of transparency came out before there began to be these scandals. I mean, were people wondering why certain contracts are being signed or who's getting these contracts before the federal investigations began? The mayor was, um, and I want to say early part of the administration, one of the, the key um, uh, pieces of policy uh, was the open access plan. And that plan uh, talked about how do you get more minority and small business owners and women-owned businesses involved in major contracts in the city. Uh, and as a result, you had some 200 plus odd uh, new companies that were able to come and participate in major contracts that had not been done in the past. Uh, so part of the, the idea at that time of transparency obviously was a public bidding and competitive bidding process. Um, so that was a, a focus and attention. Were there um, uh, contractors who had done business with the city before uh, and had done business with the city since uh, who were also supporters of the mayor? Yes. Uh, there were many contractors who did great work for the city who were also supporters of Mayor Morial. Um, uh, Tony Mumphrey comes to mind as one of those contractors. So uh, those who dealt with the city who may or may not have been supporters of the cities, some had, did, had done really wonderful work, others did not. Uh, but the issue of transparency, uh, uh, we uh, felt very good about it at the time. And, and again, it was unfortunately the select few that we lost a lot of trust in. Uh, that uh, this information has come out. No, I, I just want to tag on to that because not just in the area of contract and there's this perception of patronage. In my shop, for instance, I think I had like 42, 43 uh, unclassified employees, meaning folks that I could hire directly. Uh, and I think it was like 28 of them. The first time I met these people through their resumes. I even hired one young lady through a telephone interview. Never met her a day in her life. Now it turned out that I knew actually Sabrina Montana is in here. I think it was her niece or something to that effect. But I found out like three months later, that, and I knew Sabrina, uh, that that was a relative of her. You know, so you get this perception that, that, that you, you, you have to know somebody in order to get in. And in reality, it was quite different. Okay, next question. One of the announced purposes of, the, of these forums has been that we would look back and, and try to be an informed electorate when we're looking for our next mayor. You all have mentioned the fact that there's a huge racial divide in this city, and I'm just wondering what, you, what you've seen, not only from your inside perspective, but from where you stand today, what can we do to get past this? I mean, we've got 13 people running for mayor, and personally, sitting here and being part of this city since 1972, I could care less if they're white or black. But how are they going to get over this racial divide? And what do you see that a mayor should be doing to get past this racial issue? Give it to the judge. Well, run for election. I think we have someone that I think has, has stressed the importance of that and who has done it in some aspects, and that's President Obama. I think that what you have to do to get past the racial divide is that you have to speak to the issues that impact all of the electorate and not focus on one particular area. And I think that that's one of the things that if you're a good candidate and you come in and you talk about the issues that are important to everyone, because when you break it down, whether you're black, white, or whatever color, the issues really are the same for you in this city. Crime, education, and jobs. And I think that any candidate who's going to make it and cross that line has to address that issue and speak directly to the people and not focus in on what makes us different, but focus in on where we're similar. 
I think also, um, having been away from the city, part of the opportunity is to look at the candidates and determine who is really going to different neighborhoods, not in the neighborhoods to which they have come. Uh, are they seeking and engaging different groups in dialogue and discussion? Are they listening? Um, these were some of the attributes that, that really um, Mark and Mayor Morial always was steadfast about throughout the administration and, and when he ran for mayor. Um, I remember at times when, you know, we were, we're going to do a, a press event out in the Vietnamese community out in New Orleans East, and I was not familiar with the Vietnamese community in New Orleans East, but, you know, part of the, the opportunity was, well, they are part of this community. It's important that we be engaged and understand the concerns because uh, everyone in this community plays a part in its success. So you've got to look at the qualities and attributes of the candidates, you know, watch what they do as well as what they say. And are they firmly committed to uh, uh, racial coalition building and talking about it, being honest and upfront and talking about it? I, I think what we have to do is um, is be honest that that racism exists in the city. I, I tell people all the time we have we hear the, the cry of one New Orleans, but we have two kings of carnival. <laughs> you know, try to take away either King Rex or King Zulu and see what happens in the city. And, and, and at some point, we, we have got to get beyond that. What is it going to take? I think it's going to take a greater understanding of what the other person sees. For instance, uh, when we left office in 02 for our exit interview with the, uh, the board at the TP, it was, uh, and we sat in a, in a U-shape format. We had the administration and then we had the TP. And half of that U was all white and the other part of that U was predominantly black. You know, it said something. <laughs> In fact, I, I, I told my uh, my secretary, I called, I said, bring the camera down here, bring the camera down here. I want to get a picture <laughs> of this. You know, and it was a picture of New Orleans, unfortunately. It was a picture of New Orleans. So we, we've got to find ways to try to get beyond that. I think the trouble in an election is if a candidate sees an opportunity to get a greater vote by playing the race card, white or black, he or she often does it. And uh, it just depends on the integrity of our candidates. And, and I think we'll see in this coming election which ones have integrity and which ones don't. Okay, next question. Good evening, Michelle. It's good to see you again. Uh, this is a question I've been wanting to ask you for about uh, 10 years. Ever since okay, you okay. Uh, uh, All right. You, you've talked about <laughs> Okay, then. <laughs> uh, you, 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 know, talked a lot about, you talked a lot about uh, setting the agenda, the media agenda at City Hall. Uh, it, was, it was very interesting. I never had the honor of Ms. Morial coming to the station I used to work at, a TV station. It was very unique in that I, I did a story, and I forget what it was on. And it was at 6.10, and at 6.35, you called the station wanting to talk to me about the story. And it was inaccurate, and do you want a brochure about City Hall and things like that? And I was just wondering, like, on the second floor of City Hall, did y'all watch all the four channels? Because, you know, this is an administration that was kind of before the Internet age a lot. And so did you watch all four channels and listen to WWL radio oh and just, yeah. you know, because it was the first market I've ever been in in New Orleans where that actually happened, where the city official like yourself or the mayor would actually, you know, take you to task on what you were reporting about. Yeah. Um, yes. Yes, yes, and yes. You know, in, in 1994, remember, you know, we have cell phones, but they're like this big, right? Um, and there were no Blackberries. So I got 40 beeps a day, 40, 50 beeps a day. I mean, it's kind of a centralized communication strategy where all, all calls came to me except for police and fire. And uh, we kind of doled them out as to whether or not the mayor was going to respond, I was going to respond, or a city department head was going to respond. Um, and yes, incessantly, yes, we watched, we read the, we read the TP, we read every, every uh, print outlet, every television outlet, the five, the six, you know, WWL had the 24-hour news, we, we watched um, incessantly. Because at the end of the day, the mayor is voted on you know, twice is an opportunity, and really poll numbers and how you engage and what public's perception of how you're doing is done through the media. 
And so we had to have a sense of how we were doing. And you know, we couldn't take a poll every day. So uh, the way in which we were re reported on was really and critically important in terms of how we needed to adjust our messaging, uh, what was not emphasized, if we weren't getting a, a certain fact across as well as we should have, uh, opportunities that we missed. Uh, and so we were very, very focused on that. OK, we still have time for a couple more questions. Hi. Uh, I'm, I'm interested. One controversy that um, hasn't been um, spoken about is the um, Hano receivership. And I'm curious, um, we're, we're still having reverberations. And um, some of the, I wasn't looking here at the time, but some of the, the stories that I've heard about um, trucks with washing machines and other appliances filled to the brink um, for um, residents would show up and then by the time they got to the actual property there would maybe be two or three left in there and can can you talk about um, how that got spun out of control and um, what can you just speak to that because I'm, I'm curious to we uh, kind of found it out of control and I think it had been out of control for probably 20, 20 plus years. It, it, it was a, and we wrestled with it. What was the best approach? Uh, Mark uh, believed that the mayor had to have a close hand on what was going on at the housing authority. Uh, I probably kind of felt that uh, it was a different beast, a different animal that may have been too large to really grab a, a hold on. And I remember when we brought in the, uh, I think we called it an executive monitor when Dr. Ron Mason got appointed. It wasn't a receivership, but it was kind of a, re a receivership. It was a, uh, we, we met with the then secretary of HUD, I think Henry Cisneros was still in place, mm -hmm. and kind of worked that arrangement out so that we would have local control because that's what the residents wanted. Not only that's not what the residents wanted, you know, we kind of felt that they deserved to have a voice in where they live. One of the other things that we did that was different, um, not popular, not popular around the country, was uh, Mark appointed a majority resident manage board. And in, in his attitude and his perspective were that the so-called professionals had not done such a good job of running housing that uh, we should give the residents themselves an opportunity to go ahead and, 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 and play a leadership role. And that was frowned upon by HUD uh, and also frowned upon by others around the country. And I think primarily because they didn't want to have an engaged resident population start to prove that they could manage their own resident, the place that they live. And I think that attitude somewhat hurt our ability in making the transformation that we thought was necessary at the Housing Authority. Okay, just get this one and this last one. I have a question on, the, on New Orleans' relations with Latin America. We talked about the port, the airport, and, uh, and your trips around the country. Did Mayor Morial do anything with Latin America? Did he actually travel to the region and, and try to improve relations? You're going to have to answer that one. <laughs> um, yes, he did. Um, he made a, a, a several trips to Latin America. I think part of the opportunity was to ensure that the port, uh, and that we were losing, unfortunately, at the time, um, uh, business to uh, the port of Houston, uh, and that we were concerned that uh, that uh, uh, business would move to other ports. And so uh, part of the uh, relationship building was done. I remember he hosted the Summit of the Americas uh, here, uh, several energy summits, uh, summits of foreign ministers, and, and part of the coalition building process was to very much engage uh, both uh, the Southern Hemisphere to ensure that uh, people understood our facilities, the investment in the port, and to ensure that, that those trade relationships would stay open-ended. And this is our last question for the day. Yeah, hi. I, I just wanted to know, how, how did uh, Mark uh, and, and your, your office uh, deal with the black press? Because, uh, you know, it seemed to be now, I, I, I was away when he was uh, here in office uh, in California. And uh, I noticed that now we have uh, WBOK, 
and uh, you know that that's causing a, quite a stir in the community as far as the uh, you know getting information out, which is good. So, how, how did you all deal with uh, and Mark, the administration deal with uh, the black uh, press, like the Data newspaper and uh, LA Weekly? Um, they had a very close relationship with the black press, um, particularly the Louisiana Weekly um, and uh, the Tribune, uh, as well as uh, even uh, uh, the hip hop stations, uh, um, uh, Wild 95, right? 93. 93. Um, and so, you know, and even uh, some of the smaller stations, or the jazz stations, uh, the nonprofit stations, you know, those are important vehicles not only to get out the message, but also to ensure that there was a level of engagement and also le level of commitment to those institutions because they were part of not only cultural fabric of New Orleans, but uh, uh, de delivered news in a different way. And it was important to a majority African American community to have news that uh, people can not only rely on, but feel that they heard the mayor's voice very specifically. So we had very strong relationships with the black press, both locally and across the country. Um, Tom Joyner kind of thought it was his second home to come down here at some points. And so, um, a very strong relationships to have a smiley BET uh, at the time. Um, so we're very proud of those relationships. You know, and I guess just building on what you, you said, Michelle, the other thing that I think we, we often forget is uh, we all recognize the Essence Festival, but the that wasn't the, the end all. We engaged on an aggressive attempt to try to bring and attract black tourism to the city of New Orleans. And anyone that's in the hotel industry could tell you that during the summer months, you know, the hotels were dead. No one were in uh, those places. And when, when you didn't have folks in the hotels, you didn't have people in the restaurants. You didn't have spending going on in some of the retail shops and stuff. So we, we, we embarked upon an aggressive marketing to try to get, building upon essence, the black fraternities and sororities to come to New Orleans and hold their national conventions here, the black music industry to hold their conventions here, uh, the black MBAs and such, and on and on and on, the black governmental uh, uh, training entities. And I think when you talk about changing the landscape, while you, you think in terms of the landscape being simply physical, in this case, we changed the downtown landscape during the summer months for those hotels and those restaurant owners. All right, let's give the panel a big hand. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, the grand finale is January.